on the lighter slide. And some of you guys come just for the jokes, so here they come. Not really, I know you're here for the Lord. Okay. I've been looking guilty of, uh, I've been guilty of looking at others my own age thinking, surely I can't look that awful. Anyways, here's a situation that happened. While waiting for my first appointment in the reception room of a new dentist, I noticed his certification. And on it had his full name. Suddenly I remembered that a tall, handsome boy with the same name had been in my high school class some 40 years ago. Now for me, it'd be like 50 years, 60 years. But anyways, this is the story. 40 years ago. Uh, upon seeing him, however, I quickly discarded any such thought. This balding, gray-haired man with a deeply lined face was way, way too old to have been my classmate. As he examined my teeth, I asked him if he had attended the same local high school, and he said yes. Oh, when did you graduate, I asked, and he answered, 1957. Why? You were in my class, I explained. He looked at me closely and then said, what did you teach? <laughs> I think I would have decked him. What did you teach? Hi, Moses. There was a painter by the name of Jack who was very interested in making a penny when he could. And as often as he could, he would thin his paint to make it go farther. As it happened, he got away with this for some time, but eventually the church decided to do a big restoration job. Maybe I should say his name is Bobby, but no, no, no. That, that involved the painting of one of the biggest churches. So Jack put in a bid, and because of the price was so low, he got the job. He went about erecting the trestles and setting up the planks and buying the paint and, yes, laying it down with the turpentine. Jack was up on the scaffolding, painting away with the job, readily completed, when suddenly there was a horrendous clap of thunder and the sky opened. The torrential rain washed the thin paint off the church and knocked Jack off the scaffolding onto the lawn among the gravestones surrounded by telltale puddles of the thinned and useless paint. Jack was no fool. He knew this was a judgment from the angry God, so he got on his knees and cried, Oh God, forgive me. What shall I do? And from the thunder, a mighty voice spoke. You're going to love this. Repaint, repaint, and thin no more. Repaint, repaint, and repaint, and thin no more. Remember that body when you go paint. Yeah. Right, Bobby? We just love that. We love our Bobby. Can I have my Bible one? You know, the last couple of weeks, thank you, I'm still wrestling with those letters to the different churches that we studied in, in Revelation. And I, I'm still, I'm still stirred about those two churches. Remember Ephesus, where they just forsook their first love, and then you had the Laodiceans, who what? They were hot, soothing, or refreshingly cold, but they were lukewarm. And what the Lord say? I'm a bit ready. Okay. So when I heard that, and last week, I'm going to bring back your memory. Last week I told you, oh, what, what are some things we can do? And I said, number one, I said, last week, a key thing is Thanksgiving. And the reason why I said that is why? Because the glory always goes to the giver. When you have to thank someone, you have to humble yourself and address that person, and you're honoring that person. Many of you have a hard time saying thank you because of your pride. But when you humble yourself and say, thank you, Lord, you're redirecting your attention now to the Lord. Not unto yourself, but you direct your attention unto the Lord. So let's pray and see what the Lord has in store. Father, we thank you so much, God. We thank you for being real with us. 
We thank you, Lord, for even setting the stage for tonight's message with the words and the song that Remington spoke. God, you're so good. And I just pray now that the Holy Spirit move in this place. It won't be just another Tuesday night Bible study, but it will be a life-changing experience for many. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, I, I think I get a kick out of Pastor Watts. You know, it's let God be God, but the latest thing he is, likes to say is, all it is, I believe it boils down to just submit, just submit. How many of you say that several times? Submit, that's what you gotta do, submit. Well, when I was in the fourth grade, there was a little boy by the name of David Hawk. Now, I can still remember his name. And you know, I'm pushing, you know, and, and I can still remember that little stinker. I call him the stinker because he had a crush on me. I knew he did because in fourth grade, we would play heads down, thumbs up. Remember that game and somebody would go around and touch your thumb and you put it down and then everybody, the thumb was down, you stood up and you tried to guess who did. Well, I knew it was David because David touched my thumb all the time. And when it was time for square dancing, oh boy, fourth grade, square danced. And who did he pick? Me. But one thing that David did, and I just still remember this. We walked home up to a certain point where I went this way and he went that way. From the time we crossed the crosswalk, that little sucker would take my arm and twist it around my back like this and say, all right, all right, whenever I say frog, you leap. Now frog, frog. And I'm just jumping all over the place. You submit there, you know, you submit, you submit. And you know, God rest his soul. I wonder if he's still alive. I'd like to talk to him. But the reason why I thought about it is because I think probably, I think, um, I think that um, the reason why I brought him up is I think that there's many of us that see God that way. We see God that way. As this mean God that's there to watch you, and the minute you blow it, boy, he's there to let you know that you're going to get your nose rubbed, and he's just going to crank it up higher because he wants you. And, there, and, and submit is a, ooh, it's a word that's not really pleasant to the ears. So when Walt says, I think it's all about submitting to God, I'm like, oh, okay, submit. We need to know, number one, what are we talking about and who are we submitting to is a key thing. Do you know the God that we're supposed to submit to? Now, that sounds like a crazy, a crazy question. But, you know, I could say, you know, I know Tommy Barnett. Now, some of you don't even know who Tommy Barnett is, but he's the one that started the big Dream Centers and the Dream City Church, a beautiful man. If I told you that I know Tommy Barnett, you would say, well, okay, how long have you known him? What do you know about him? And you know, I've known him for some time, and I could share with you some things I've learned about him, but do I really know him? No, I don't know him like Marla does in life. I really don't know him like God does him. But I really don't know him. So many of us say that, yeah, I know God. I know the Lord. I know the Lord. You ask people on the street, I know the Lord. They'll even say, I love the Lord. But do they know the Lord? Sometimes people have a concept of the David Hot syndrome where God is just all justice. And this is the God you have. Is this justice and beating you down and making you answer, duh, duh, duh. And you think you're still paying for some of the mistakes that you made in the past. And others of you have a God who's, well, I feel he's this way. I love to think of him as being my best friend. I think that and I feel that and you don't know him. You're projecting how you feel and want him to be. And chances are you are going to eliminate Eclipse the fact that he is also a just God. And so I think to solve some of the problems that we face in the in this wishy-washy Christianity that we were we learned about in Revelation, 
We've got to submit, but we've got to know that God we're submitting to. I think, you know, what blew my mind is when I started looking at the God of the Old Testament. Most people, not most, there's a lot of people who say, forget the Old Testament. I like the New Testament. The Old Testament, he's like, mm, 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 the David Hawk syndrome, you know. But yeah, he's not that way in the New. Well, let me guess this. When you take a look at the Old Testament, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I want you to take a look, and if you want to put the first slide up, Exodus 34, 5 through 7. This is a passage in the Old Testament that is very, very, very important. It is very important. Just to refresh your memory, Moses has gone back up the hill. I say back up, you know, the people that are the golden calf and all that stuff. And he goes up there to see God, and he says, you know, I want, to, I want to know you. I want to know who you are. And the Lord said, well, I'm going to let my goodness, my goodness, Pastor, and I'm going to, and this is what the Lord did. Now, you guys keep in mind, God is a spirit, but he communicates us in the word of God and the love that we can understand. But there's definitely attributes in God, and I'm not talking about his, his being all powerful or all wise. But there are definite attributes in God that we reflect. We were made in his image. Okay. But let's take a look at how he identifies himself. He first of all says, the Lord, the Lord. Now you guys have already learned in the Hebrew, when you repeat things twice, it's important. So the very first thing he wants Moses to know, and he wants us to know, and this is the Old Testament, that he is, I am that I am. I am the creator, I am the sustainer, I always was, I always will be, I am in charge. Okay, he sets that stage. But then look how he refers to himself. I'm a God merciful and gracious. Merciful not giving you what you deserve. He's merciful. And he's gracious. He gives you what you don't deserve. The rain falls what on the just and the unjust. All right? So he's merciful and he's gracious. And he's slow to anger. He's not a, um, what do you call it? person you can't predict, you know, you know, ready to ready to fire away at you. No, he's slow to anger. He's slow to anger, which means what? He's patient with you. He puts up with an awful lot. How many know that? Okay? And then he's abounding, he's overflowing in steadfast love. Not a love here and maybe a little bit here, but steadfast, steady, 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 steady. Merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and then he's abounding, overflowing in love, and what? Faithfulness. God is faithful. This is true, my friends. This is God himself telling you who he is. Then he goes on to say this. He's a forgiving God, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. And what is he talking about? He's talking about that Willful rebellion with no, just continually doing something wrong. Also, your natural bent that you always end up finding yourself doing, which is not pleasing to him. But he's a forgiving God. This is the Old Testament, my friend. This is the Lord, what he's telling Moses. But then there's another side to that. Look what he's saying here. But who will by no means Clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. God is a just God. If you look at Exodus 25, he says, visiting the iniquities of the father on the father of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Okay? So he's all these gracious, kind, compassionate, 
And yet there's a side to him that says, for those who hate me, there's another story. Okay? And he's telling us what he's like. Um, in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish. That's the God we serve. That's the God we're talking about. He's a faithful God. The minute man fell in Genesis, the minute he fell, what did the Lord say? Turned and said, you know what? The seed of that woman, somebody from the line of, of um, um, Adam and Eve, is what is going to crush the head of the evil one, although he is going to what? Get the heel, the Achilles tendon. From the very beginning, you see love. You see promise. You see long suffering. Amen? Now, it's interesting because this is, this is God. What about Jesus? What about Jesus? You know, in John 14, 8 and 9, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to Philip, have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has sent me, seen me, has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Jesus is saying, the Father is in me, I am in him. Who is the Father? The Father is the one who is merciful and kind, slow to anger and rich in love. Jesus has said, I and the Father are one. Who is Jesus? He's all those things. But there's another side to Jesus. There's another side to Jesus. He turned to the people who hated him, mm, hated him, what did he say? You're of your father, what? The devil. He looked at the Pharisees who had an understanding of God that was enshrined in justice. And salvation for them was separation from those dirty sinners. What did Jesus say? Woe unto you. A prophet can say, blessed are you, or he could say condemnation or be damned or woe unto you. So out of the mouth of Jesus, he turned to the ones who didn't love him or the Father, and he spoke forth damnation. He said to a bunch of cities, and yet that same Jesus wept over Jerusalem, cried and said, oh, I wanted you, I tried, I wanted you to come, I wanted you to come and I... I want you like a, I'm like a hen. I want you to come, little chicks. And I want to cover you with my wings. But you would not come. So you see, even in Jesus, you see there's two sides there. To really see Jesus, let's take a look at, at Matthew 11, 28. Matthew 11, 28. That's the next slide, please. That's it up there. That's it right there. I might add that Jesus is speaking here right after he has looked at the ones that didn't love him and he pronounced the curses. Curse the Pharisees, curse the cities. And then the way he says, he turns and he says what? He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Who is he talking to? He's talking to people that are the hardest to love. They're the ones that are so screwed up and messed up. They're loaded down with their guilt and their burdens. They're eating the consequences of their choices and they're heavy laden. Heavy laden. 
And then the God, Jesus, <laughs> who remember is God. He's what? He's gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and rich in love. And what does he say? He says, submit. And what's the word for submit there is come. Come. You see, there's people here that he's saying, come. You've had a hard life. Your life is so screwed up. And you're fighting it. And you're battling it. And you have been embracing a God who isn't God. God has revealed himself in his word in the Old Testament. And now in the manifestation of his son Jesus Christ. Who is God. And he's saying, I want you. Come. Come to me. It means you're going to leave wherever it is and you're going to turn and you're going to come to him. And what is God going to give you? Rest. Rest. Oh, there's nothing better than rest. There's nothing better than knowing that you know that you know that the load is off, that I am loved, that God is gracious and compassionate and he's showering his love upon me. And I will give you rest. And then he says what? Next submission. Take what? My yoke upon you. Maybe the harness for two oxen. Jesus is in one and he says, come here. Come here. I want you to be next to me. You're with me. I'm the big ox. I will, I will guide. I will direct. Come into me. Um, and then he says, um, take my yoke upon me and learn of me. And what does that mean? It means allow me to disciple you. Remember Pastor Mandy's message. Disciple you. Disciple you. I think this is a, I think this is a, a, a summons to people who don't know God. Because when you come... We know through the rest of the scripture that when you come, you're turning your back, you repentance, you, you admit the fact that you are no good, that life's a mess, and that you need Christ, and you're willing to turn and come to the one that Christ, the God who loved you so much that he gave his beloved son, the one in whom he was well pleased, to a Christ who loved the Father so much that he said, I'm not going to say anything without him telling me what to say. I'm not going to do anything without him showing me. And I'm going to obey. I'm going to submit to the love of the Father because he loves me so much, I will give my life so that the Father can give that love to the people, you and me. Because there's two sides to God's goodness. His love and his mercy, but his justice. God is God. He will not violate his righteousness. Henceforth, he gives Jesus to measure up what we didn't and pay that price. And so now he says, come. You're no longer the father, your father, the devil. Those are hard words. But you see, you're adopted into the family of God. When you come to Christ and you receive his yoke, you are literally adopted into the family. And now you can say, Abba, Father, Daddy, God. Amen. The God who says, let me show you my goodness. I'm merciful and kind. I'm slow to anger. I'm rich in love. I forgive your iniquities. I will heal your disease. That's the goodness of God. And it's his love, you see, as Remington mentioned, that then compels you to what? Submit. It's none of this David Hawk submit, but it's, oh God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Take you my yoke upon, on, upon you. Learn of me for what I am gentle, the word meek means 
he has he has power under control. He's meek and he's he's gracious and kind. And he's lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You see, when you're not under his yoke, the the ways of the transgressor are hard, are hard, are hard. Last verse I want you to look at, 2 Thessalonians 3, 3-5. 3 through 5. 3 through 5. God is love, he's also just. You come to him, and then he sends his Holy Spirit to dwell within you. The Holy Spirit is God. He who dwells within you, in you and him, is the one who is gracious and kind and slow to anger and rich in love. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3-5. Three Paul is speaking. Next slide, three. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. That is a truth. You're his, you're yoked to him. He is going to set you and establish you and protect you from the evil one. It is finished, declared on the cross. Payment paid. The enemy is defeated. He will do that. That's a truth. Know the truth. So the liar doesn't feed you a bunch of meaning that six, but you deleted that one. Okay, and we have confidence. This is what blew my mind. Look at Paul saying. Look what he says. Paul and, and his fellow people that whoever was right in Thessalonians. We, Paul and the apostles, have confidence. I blew my mind. I thought for sure he'd say, we know we got confidence in you, Thessalonians. You're doing so good. I know you're going to keep on doing good. You're great. You're wonderful. No. Look what Paul says. He says, what? We have confidence in the Lord about you. I'm going to say that again. We have confidence in the Lord about you. What's the confidence? That you are doing and will do the things that we command. Paul saying, you understand how much God loves you? Do you understand the Spirit of Christ lives in you and you are in Him? He's the one. He's in you both to will and to do what He wants you to do. And Paul saying, I'm confident in the Lord that He's going to do that in you. Lay aside all that striving. Some of you guys have gone right back into the yoke of the world where you're trying so hard to measure up, trying to balance the good things because you're doing a lot of bad things. You're worshiping the wrong God. Okay? That's what's exciting. Look what he says. He's confident. Now, what are we supposed to do? Look what he says. May the Lord direct your hearts, Remington, to the love of God, and to the what? Steadfastness of Christ. What is he saying? You keep your eyes on the Lord. Allow the Lord, the love of Christ, to rule in your hearts. Just like we were seeing tonight. Why? Because it's his love, the Father's love, that motivated the Son to be obedient and to submit. And it's the love of the Father for you that's going to teach you. Yoke to him, being a disciple. He's going to teach you what? To say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. You don't want to go back to that old, miserable, broken lifestyle. No. Because he gives you rest. He gives you peace. For those of us who are Christians, we need to really examine our hearts. Remember who God is. Seek his face. Ask for the forgiveness. Because if you say you have no sin, 
and he's addressing this to Christians. Walt said, deceiving yourself. If you say you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself, and the truth is not in But if you confess your sins, he is what? That's his character. That's part of his love. And what will he do? He will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Restoring that peace that he has promised to give you. So those of you who have ears to hear, I pray the Holy Spirit has moved upon your heart if you say, you know, I have flippantly said I know the Lord, but I really don't know him. Come unto him. You're weary and you're tired and you're heavy laden. Receive the gift of salvation and he will give you rest. And for those of us who are Christians who just take him for granted, go back to our stinking thinking, trying to measure up, trying to do whatever, we neglect our relationship with him. Pastor JC is talking about prayer, how important it is. I want you to meditate on who God is, who Jesus is, and the fullness of his love for you. Because it's his love that's going to do the motivating. He's the motive and the motivation for your Christian walk. Amen? Father, we thank you so much, God, for your word. Your word is true. I just pray, oh God, that the word submit tonight will have a whole different connotation. That we will not have an arm twisted behind our backs, but we'll have a loving, loving Father and a loving Son and a loving Holy Spirit who says, come. And that we would draw close to you, be discipled by you, our yoke partner, so that we can walk in peace and share in the good news of peace to a lost and dying world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you.